hands of that song says, What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Together singing now. What Welcome to the Sunday worship service of the Jupiter Road Baptist Church, Garland, Texas. Dr. James Starks, pastor. You are now viewing the 1050 a.m. worship service. For your convenience, we also have an early worship service at 9 a.m. The departmentalized and graded Sunday school program begins at 10 a.m. Last week during a testimony meeting, several of our people expressed their thanks and appreciation for what the Lord had done for them during 1983 and also set some goals for 1984. In keeping with our theme, More in 84, we want to share some of these exciting testimonies that were given in our New Year's Eve service. We will now go to that service. But I just want to say praise God for this past year. He has uh, brought me and my family a long, long way, and I just thank him for it because we have grown in ways that we didn't know that we needed to grow. And listening to you talk, Jimmy, about God wants you to trust him, and that's what my family and I have learned. We've always been Christians, but we really learned this past year to trust him for anything that we needed. We just trusted him. When we started this year, I, I gave a little testimony not long ago and told you all how we were starting a new business and we didn't really know from day to day what was going to happen, but we knew one thing. We knew God was going to meet all of our needs, and he has done that, and we just thank him for it, and we thank him for the, the closeness that we have in our family family now. And if you, I just, you know, I could go on and on. I just, it's just spilling over. I want to tell you so many things. But God is real and he will do exactly what he says he'll do if you'll just trust him. Amen. My daughter got to go on to be with the Lord this year and uh, God's given us strength to go through a lot of things this year. I'm thankful that the holidays are over. I thank the Lord for the fact that Christmas has been set aside for the for what we celebrate as his birth and I'm thankful for the for the new year that we're going into because we're all, I'm going to be actively working in the Rachel Martinez Memorial Auditorium Fund Amen. and uh, we could not have gone through anything this year had it not been for the church and you especially Brother Jamie the blessing that you've been and friends just all around the church has been such a tremendous blessing to us Real hurry, Bill Pascal's coming there. Preacher, I just want to tell the church, you know, I discussed with you one day about, I believe that Jupiter Road Baptist Church is probably the closest thing to a New Testament church that I know anything about or have ever been in. And I used to be around speaking in churches all the time. And, and I tell you, folks, it's amazing what we have here. I've always uh, wanted to see a church really take off that I could be a part of and really do something for the Lord that would really, uh, really not impress the Lord but would cause people to come and give their hearts to Jesus Christ and be saved. And uh, I believe this year we took a giant step in that direction. Amen. I think all the events that happened this year were uh, in God's will and in God's plan for this church and for me especially. Amen. God bless you. Charlotte? Being here in the last six months, I have seen more people saved in this church than I did in the seven or eight years of the church I belong to. And that says a lot. You people care. And that's what struck me when I walked in this door the first time. I could just feel the Holy Spirit. And I could feel the love and the caring of all the people in here. And the Lord at one time put Bob in a situation and I that we didn't know what we were going to do. But it worked out great. God has blessed us. You taught me what the meaning of giving is all about. You said, why don't you try tithing on an anticipated income? I said, okay, I'm going to do that. And the Lord gave me more than what I was anticipating on getting. <laughs> and so I just want to thank everybody here in the church for their love and for their friendship. And for the year of 1984, my goal is... First, I'd like to get my nose fixed so I could breathe and quit bugging my husband so much. About it. 
but I uh, would like to give more to the Lord than I ever have, and I'm not only speaking of money, but of myself Amen. and to others. Amen. God bless you, Charlotte. God bless you, Pepper. Uh, yeah, uh, this summer when we went to camp, I made a commitment to the Lord to be a full-time Christian. You know, I'd come to church on Sunday, be Mr. Christian, you know. I'd go to school. People wouldn't even know I'd go to church. But I said to myself, this got to stop. I, you know, I got to live a full-time Christian life. And I started living it. You know, people at school would tell me stuff like, you don't drink or smoke. And, I, you know, I'd say, no, I don't smoke or drink, you know. But now, you know, I say, no, I don't do that. I'm a Christian, you know. God doesn't want me to do that, and he doesn't want you to do that, you know. My goal in uh, 84 is to read the Bible through and uh, to get <clears throat> to get uh, more people saved and to get people coming to church and, and to just really go on fire for the Lord at school. Amen. God bless you, Pepper. <coughs> well, uh, I'm, I'm new to the church. I've been here maybe uh, three or four months, and I've had quite a few blessings since then. And one of my biggest blessings is Billy House. He he pressured me into going to church. He he asked me he asked me one week, and I said no. You know, I don't know. I guess I was just thought I was too big for it or something. I don't know. And I went, and I, we were in the class, and everybody was singing. And I looked at everybody. Everyone was just singing. You could see the love in our youth group, and. I thought, well, you know, this is this is strange. You know, this is new to me. And uh, well, things set in, and I got saved. You know, and I'm real glad for that. I've I've had my times when I had my doubts, and I'd pray, and uh, the Lord would really come through for me. And uh, this youth group here is everybody in the group is, is a blessing to me, and I love them all. Amen. And uh, you yourself, and I've heard Mr. Turner's testimony, and that really touched my heart. If you have set some goals for your spiritual life in 1984, we would like for you to write and tell us of your goals. Our address is the Jupiter Road Baptist Church, 2422 North Jupiter Road, Garland, Texas, 75042. We now return to our regular Sunday morning service. Listen as our choir sings the song entitled, Where Your Treasure Is.
almost as alive as the first service was. <laughs> and may I tell you, they were dead, D double D dead. <laughs> but we did have a couple of young couples saved in the first service. I say young, in the early 80s. They got saved in the first service. A lot of folk out of town today, and I noticed Eric flew in to be in service today, and I'm delighted he did. Uh, I want you to remember in prayer, I did not know it till this morning, I was in a Christmas party with a young man that works for Mr. Perry Bowden here back uh, two nights before Christmas. And uh, I understand he left there, and a day or two later, well, he went into a coma. And uh, he's in Plano General Hospital. Kevin, I was out there yesterday and didn't know he was there, but you pray for him. Let's, let's pray that God will intervene. Open your Bibles to the book of Matthew, chapter number 4, and 1 Corinthians, chapter number 1, and I'll share two verses with you, and then I'll preach on the subject entitled, Happy New Year. Happy New Year. In the book of Matthew, chapter number 4, verse 23 is the verse I'll choose there. And then in the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter number 1, I'll choose verse number 10, or verse number 17, I'll use from there. In verse 23 in Matthew 4, it's talking about the early ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ immediately after the baptism. In verse 23, it says, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And then in verse 17 of chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians, another great apostle Paul, in verse 17, he said, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. I'm sure that many have already began to make New Year's resolutions. Some have said, I'm going to read the Bible through this year. I can't think of a greater challenge for any of us. Amen. And simply just to get in the Bible and began at Genesis 1 and 1, in the beginning with God. And read all the way through. Let me encourage you. You read three chapters a day. And on Sunday, read five, and you'll read through the entire Bible this year. Be faithful to read through the Bible. What a great book it is. 66 books, 1,189 chapters. 31,423 verses, 772,691 words. Let me encourage you to read through the Bible. Possibly some of us have determined that we began a diet today. I'm sure Perry hasn't, but he doesn't mean to lose any weight, but some of us have. But my wish for you this morning and throughout this entire year is this, that you not only have a happy and prosperous new year, but your year is happy and prosperous throughout the entire year. Jesus intended for you to be happy. John 10 says, The thief cometh not for, but for to steal, and to destroy and to kill, but I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Amen. The two passages, uh, passages of Scripture that I shared with you this morning, one had to do with the beginning of our Lord's earthly ministry. And as I follow our Lord's ministry through the Word of God, I find it was a full ministry. Same with the Apostle Paul. They had full lives. Not too long ago, on the Merv Griffin show, there was a man that was interviewed that had gained $16 million in a short time. Merv Griffin asked him, he said, do you have enough? 
The man replied, no. He said, do you intend to make more money? He said, yes, I intend to keep making money. He said, making money is kind of like the game Monopoly, only it's used real money, and money was the way that the score was kept. Merv Griffin asked him, he said, are you happy? The man sat up straight in the chair that he'd been slumped in, and he said, no, I'm not happy. Money does not make you happy. He said, I have a lot of friends that have a lot of money, and said, many of them are not happy. And he said, I know some people that have no money, and yet many of them are happy. And then Merv Griffin, Griffin asked him the question. He said, what does it take to make a man happy? And the man replied, he said, there are three things that are essential to anyone's happiness. And that's someone to, something to do, someone to love, and something to look forward to. Some, something to do, someone to love, and something to look forward to. That's one man's road to happiness. Yet he, in all of the question of happiness, this man said not one word about Jesus Christ. I believe that Jesus Christ is the one essential way and the one essential key to abundant living. Christ is the life filled to overflowing. And still, as we ponder of the meaning of our lives today, this man's road to happiness can be helpful to us. Notice what he said. He said, in the first place, if you expect to be happy, you must have something to do. A happy life is one that is filled with meaningful activity. Even in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve were to tend the garden. The Bible said, six days shall thy work. Jesus said, whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with all of your might. Sometimes we're tempted to regard paradise as the absence of responsibility. We look around, and I look back in this year, and I can say that each one of you can relate to what I would say, that many times the load got heavy. But think about if there was nothing to do. The human creature has been fashioned in such a way that meaningful activity is essential to a peace of mind. A person who sits around with nothing to do will come to depression and despair. The first way station on the road to happiness is something to do. So many today have no direction in life whatsoever. Our young people are raised up and they're not taught how to work and by work does many things, but one thing that work does, a good hard days of work puts character in an individual and oh, how we need to get back and make a nation that is a nation that is a prosperous nation and a working nation. There's nothing wrong with work. Dr. Edward Rosen now, formerly with Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, told of an experience that caused him to be associated with the field of medicine. He said when he was just a lad at home, said he had a younger brother and said that younger brother became very ill and said his parents sent for the doctor away out in the country and they waited patiently for the arrival of the doctor and said finally the doctor arrived and said they waited and watched. He said he watched patiently and looked at the anxiety and the anguish on the face of his parents as the doctor examined the boy. And he said finally the doctor completed his examination and turned to the parents with a smile on his face. And he said, your boy's going to be all right. And Dr. Rosen now said, he related years later when telling of what drew him into the field of medicine. And he said, I watched the light and the joy fill my mother and dad's face. And he said, I determined right then 
that I was going to become a doctor so I could light people's face up and bring a smile to their face. Listen to me this morning. Meaningful activity is very, very important in our lives. And oh, how we need something to do. Yeah. You suppose that Dr. Rosen now was a happy man. He said, I'm going to be a doctor so I can put light in people's faces. And let me hurriedly say that doctors are not the only ones that can put light in people's faces. A good dedicated school teacher, a mechanic, or a plumber, or anyone that chooses their life's work and does it with the right attitude and forceful and for the glory of God, they can bring light on people's faces. And so I say to you this morning that in order to be happy, we must have something to do. Matthew, our scripture in Matthew this morning describes Jesus' early ministry, and it was a ministry of, of purpose. He had purpose in his life. Not only that, but sometimes it was an exhausting activity. But our Lord continued on. Look what the scripture said. It said, Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues. And if you picture Jesus Christ as a scholarly recluse waiting for people to come to him, let me say that you have to change your image of him after reading this verse of scripture. He was busy about the Father's business. He said, on one occasion, I must work the works of him that sent me while it's day, the night cometh when no man shall work. So our Lord knew what it was to be a hard-working, a dynamic individual, and he knew what it was all about to have something to do. And, oh, I feel sorry for people that don't have anything to do. If you don't have a goal, I challenge you to set a goal and press toward that goal. With God's help, you'll reach that goal. The great apostle Paul knew what it was to work also. He spells out his calling. He said, Christ sent me not to preach, not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Paul knew his limitations, but he had a clear understanding of what God had called him to do. And I believe that God has a work for every one of us. And as we look into 1984, if every member of the Jupiter Road Baptist Church would find that ministry and began to let the Holy Spirit of God minister to us, through us, to others, we could really evangelize the world Amen. for the cause of Christ. Paul said, he sent me not to baptize, but he sent me to preach. And Paul preached the gospel. And oh, how we need to find our gift and find that gift of God and began to let the Holy Spirit of God minister through us. I believe the problem with many of us today is that we have no sense of overall purpose or direction in our lives. The average young person today finished 12 years of high school and go off to four years of college. And you can ask them, what are you doing, going to do with your life? They say, I don't know. I believe God has, anything as important as God's will for your life, God has not hid that will. Amen. It's open here in the word of God. It's time that we search out and know God's will for our life Amen. and get some purpose in our life and some direction to our life that the Holy Spirit of God might live through us and others might hear and be saved. Amen. Thomas Carlyle compared human beings with ships. And he said about 75% can be compared to ships without rudders, subject to every shift of wind and tide. He said they're helplessly adrift while they fondly hope that one day they'll drift into a rich and successfully successful port. They end up usually on the rocks. Now, if I were to ask the question in here this morning, how many would like to be a millionaire? I dare say there's not a one that wouldn't raise their hand. I know I'd raise my hand. Let me say to you this morning, you can do ever what you want to do for the glory of God. And when you see a millionaire, unless he inherited that money, you can say that he had something to do and he set some goals and he began to work toward those goals. And as he began to work toward those goals, yes, there were discouragements. Yes, there was depression time. But he always had that goal in sight. Amen. 
And let me say to you, in 1983, I can look back and there was disappointments. I can look back and there was mistakes. But oh, I tell you, the victories overcome the mistakes two to one. And so I'd say to you this morning, don't be like the ship without a rudder, but get a goal and a purpose in mind and press toward that goal. And when disappointment comes and when you're knocked down, get up and go again and keep on going and going and going. Many of us are like the Texan. We have no goal. The old Texan walked up to the uh, ticket counter at the airport and he said, give me a ticket. And the ticket agent was nervously flipping through the tickets and he said, where to? And the old Texan said, anywhere, said, I got business everywhere. I'm afraid a lot of us are like that. It's fine to have business all over, but happiness comes for most of us by centering in on what's really important in our lives and then with the glow, for the glory of God getting after it. Amen. So I say to you this morning, in order for happiness, there must be something to do. In the second place, I believe we need someone to love. Amen. This whole world is starving to death for love. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son Oh, for the love of God, how we need to love and to be loved and to need, be needed and to need someone. In Mr. Arthur Gordon's book, On a Touch of Wonder, he tells about his days as a boy scout. He said, I had a troop leader who was an ardent woodsman and naturalist and said he'd take us out on a hike and he'd tell us as he took us out, he'd bring us back and he'd challenge us to describe everything that we saw the trees and the flowers and the birds and uh, the wildlife. He said everything. And invariably, uh, Arthur said we would describe only a quarter of what he, ha he had seen. And said then after we had described it, said, said he would say creation is all around and he would cry waving his arms in vast inclusive circles. And he would say, but you're keeping it out. He said this, don't be a buttoned up person. He said, stop wearing your raincoat in the shower. He was talking about being open and sensitive to the wonders of creation. But I've known plenty of persons in my lifetime who were the kind of people that had a buttoned up experience. They wouldn't get near anyone. They wouldn't allow anyone to love them and get close to them. And they wouldn't love anyone. And oh, what they were missing in life. I say to you this morning, take off your overcoat, your raincoat, and get out in the rain of God's love. Amen. And that let love shower on you. C.S. Lewis, I believe, said it best. And I'll quote verbatim from what one of his books. He said, to love at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything in your heart will certainly be wrung and possibly be broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give your heart to no one, not even to an animal. Wrap it carefully around with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it'll change. It'll not be broken. It will become unbreakable. It'll be impossible to penetrate. It'll become irredeemable. The only place, Lewis said, outside of heaven where you can be perfectly safe from all the dangers of love is hell. Listen to me this morning. We not only need something to do, we need someone to love. Amen. Somebody said, but pastor said, I have no one to love. My family and my friends are all gone. My heart goes out to you this morning, but I must say to you that you must not allow your capacity to love to die with your family and friends. Find someone upon whom you can store your love and give them that love. Amen. And it might be good not only for them, but also for you. I didn't share this in the first service, but I must share it here this morning, an illustration I've shared here before of the young boy that was selling papers out on the street corner in the cold 
win in New York City. The fellow had to wait on the bus and he noticed the boy there with a smile on his face and he would sell a paper here and there. So he began to speak to the boy and he said, son, what's your name? And he said, Charlie. And he said, Charlie, he said, where do you live? And he said, down by the creek bank in a little shack. And he said, Charlie, do you live alone? And he said, oh, not, no, not alone. And he said, Charlie, who lives with you? And he said, Arthur. And he said, where is Arthur? And he said, Arthur's at home. And he said, well, what does Arthur do? He said, oh, said Arthur doesn't, doesn't do anything. He said, he's not able to work. He said, he's a cripple. And the man said to Charlie, he said, well, Charlie, said, is Arthur your brother? Is he kin to you? He said, oh, no, just a friend. He said, why don't you get rid of him? And said, then you'd have more for yourself. And Charlie said, oh, but mister, said, Charlie, said, Arthur's all I got. Said, if I were to get rid of Arthur, said, I'd have nothing. Said, I wouldn't want to live if I couldn't have someone to love and someone to share what I have with. And so do you this morning, I say, if we're going to be happy, we must have something to do and someone to love. Amen. Mother Teresa, that great missionary, left behind her family and friends when she left to serve God in Calcutta, India. In that great and tragic city, she found persons who needed her love. And one night she was called urgently to the little hovel of a woman with several small children who were starving to death. And Mother Teresa took a small bag of rice and with an assistant she went to that place and while she was attending to the pitifully emancipated children, she set the little bag of rice down by her side. In a moment, she noticed that the bag of rice was missing, and so was the woman. In a few minutes, the lady returned, and the bag of rice was set down where she had picked it up, but about half of it was gone. And she turned to her and asked her, said, what did you do with the rice that it shrunk to half its formal size? The woman looked at her quietly and said, they're hungry too, and she pointed next door. And next door there was a Muslim family that lived, and they were also starving to death. And this Hindu woman had taken and shared what she had with them. And I say in all of her poverty and all of her problems, she hadn't forgotten how to love. And don't you ever lose your capacity to love. They might as well dare you. Oh, in one of the books that Adolphus Huxley, that modernist, a man that's against everything that's normal from God. And he wrote this. He said, of all the worn, smudged, dog-eared words in our vocabulary, he said, love is the grubbiest, it's the smelliest, it's the slimiest. Bore its ball from a million pulpits lavishly crooned through hundreds of millions of loudspeakers. It has become an outrage to good taste and decent feeling and an obscenity which one hesitates to pronounce. And yet he adds, it has to be pronounced for after all, love is the last word. Love is the last word. We were created to love. Because he first loved us, we must find someone to love or we'll be living like wearing a raincoat in the rain. Our life, if we don't love, it'll be futile, it'll be pointless, it'll be unsatisfying, and ultimately it will be dead. If we have happiness this year, we must have something to do. Someone to love real hurriedly something to look forward to that's a big problem with many of us we've lost confidence in life we've lost confidence in ourselves and ultimately many have lost confidence in God and therefore we don't really feel that we have anything to look forward to but oh I'll tell you we that are saved we have something to look forward to. Amen. Lisa, sing about it this morning. Amen. That holy and beautiful city, it's coming down from God, prepared as a bride adorned for a husband. Amen. We've got it to look forward to. I'm reminded of the overweight person 
And I heard about seated one day in a restaurant by two slimmer friends. The two slender ladies drink unsweetened tea. And the not so slim one had sitting before her a seven dip hot fudge marshmallow whipped cream nuts and cherry covered high calorie monster. She said, I've tried calorie counting. I've tried the crash diets. I tried jogging. I tried isometrics. And she said, now I'm trying for the heavyweight champion of the world. <laughs> At least she was trying for something. Amen. I heard about another overweight woman. I tell all them today because the days when you're going to die. She's about 60 pounds overweight, and the doctor had been vi advising her for several months about her problem. No matter what sort of diet he would prescribe, she just wouldn't stick to it. And finally one day he said to her, he said, we've tried everything I can think of to get your weight down, but you won't follow directions. He said, I'll tell you what to do. I said, I've got one suggestion left. He said, why don't you forget about dieting and just learn to be jolly? <laughs> I think that's a lot, of li I think that's a lot, lot like a lot of us. In both of those instances, the message is clear. You might as well give up. There's no hope. You're a failure. And that's all you'll ever be. But listen, this morning, when you stumble, look up. He's there. Amen. Look how many times Moses failed. Babe Ruth. For many of us, we kind of like Babe Ruth. Did you know that Babe Ruth struck out more times than what he hit home runs? He hit in his career more than 700 home runs, but he also holds the record for strikeouts, 1,330. I doubt if any man will ever surpass or even equal Babe Ruth. But Babe Ruth is not known for his strikeouts. He's known for his home runs. And listen to me this morning. I believe with all of my heart that God is wanting to give you the very desire of your heart. And I believe if you'll buckle up and get that goal and get that purpose in your life and see, get after that mark and do something for the glory of God, you'll have that success. Amen. A few strikeouts doesn't mean your life's over. There's much in life to look forward to. If you'll just regard life as an investment that God has invested in us and for the glory of God, go forward. I heard of a man named J.C. Rossi who, while others were committing suicide on the day of the stock market crash, at the beginning of the Great Depression, he made millions why? Because he had a dream. He had a dream of building the tallest building in the world. And he encouraged some of his friends to... He sold all of his stock just a few weeks before the stock market fell. He encouraged all of his friends to sell all of their stock and invest in his dream. And on, on the day that the stock market fell... Bowsy was rolling in grandeur. Why? Because he invested in a dream. If God's given you a dream, get after that dream. A young man came to my office this week, and I'm looking at him right now, and I called his name. But I told him, I said, he said, well, I think the devil may discourage me a little bit. I said, he will. But just get you a goal, and when you fail, don't think, don't count failure as the end of life, but get up. Thank God for failure. 
If you'll permit it. God do when you fail and when you fall. If you'll let God, God will lift you up and place you on a mountaintop that you can see farther than you've ever seen in your life. I began this year by challenging the Jupiter Road Baptist Church. You ladies and gentlemen here, God wants you to have the very best. God wants you to be successful. And yes, for success, forever success, there'll be a dozen failures, but the success is worth all of those failures. Get up and go. I'm looking at Bill Pascal now. He's so positive until he could sell snow to Eskimos. You never see him discouraged. But of the men that I pastor, I've never seen many fail as many times Bill Pascal has. If it wasn't for Carmen, he'd be dead right now. I mean, I used him as an example. I've passed him for about 12 years. I've seen him fail. I've been with him in his failures. Dale Moore's come to the Amenia tank, and he's down, and he's discouraged, and he's failed, but he don't stay down. And I say to you this morning, get your dream. And don't stop Amen. until that dream is a reality, and just before it becomes a reality, get you another dream. Amen. There's a song goes after I leave for worlds unknown. Over the borderline, will I be missed by those I love? What will I leave behind? How are you investing your life? It was this concept of life as an investment that led Alfred Nobel to establish the so-called Nobel Peace Prize. As the inventor of dynamite, Nobel, a moody, yet idealistic Swede, had become a millionaire. Nobel's older brother, Ludwig, died of heart trouble in, on April the 12th, 1888. A leading French newspaper misread the report and ran an obituary of Alfred Nobel, calling him a merchant of death. Upon reading the obituary, Nobel was stunned, not by the premature announcing of his passing, but by the realization that in the end he would be considered nothing more than a merchant of death. The printed summary of his life in just a few short sentences reflected none of his hope for humanity. He said, what about my love for my fellow beings? He said, I've been generous. Generous. What about my generosity? And so Alfred Nobel said, I must change the image. And he set aside and he set up one of the most prestigious awards in the world today. It's given to those who do the most to advance science and peace and literature. How are you investing your life? Is it making a long investment in the kingdom of God? Or what are you doing? There's a road to happiness if we flounder by the way. Get up! We're not at the end of the road. I challenge you this morning, and the crowd is small. It was almost this large in the early service this morning. A lot of folks, I guess, came to the early service. I don't know, but... I challenge you here this morning. You're here for a reason. When God takes one, he makes, makes no mistake. You see, God is the author of life and death. And when God leads one, leaves one here, he makes no mistake. And since you're sitting here this morning, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt there's a purpose for your life. Find that purpose. And then let me encourage you in this. When you find that purpose, whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with all your might. Amen. Don't stop. Don't quit. And God will give you a happy, blessed, prosperous entire year. But I'd say to you that are not saved this morning. A couple came in and after, just before I began to preach this morning and sat down right over here, about 35 years old, I suppose, 
And I said, this is your life, but it's also God's life. It's the only one you'll live here. But God wants to give you the very best. Have you prepared to meet God? Those two young folks, 35, about 35 years old, came forward and met Jesus Christ this morning. If you don't know him, why not? Why not today? Why not trust him now? You young folks, maybe you've made a false profession. You may have been in the baptismal waters. Some of you in the center aisle, you may have been down this aisle, but never trusted Christ. You own this aisle. Do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt, if you were to die right now, you'd go to heaven? If not, then let's settle it this morning. Let's stand together. Our Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the Word of God and for every promise in it. Lord Jesus, I love you. Thank you for the greatest year I've ever experienced in my life this past year. And now, Lord, I believe you want this next this year we're in now to even be greater. And I know it's that way if we'll just submit to you. So I pray, Lord, I've got something to do. I've got a lot of things to do. Got a lot of people to love. And, oh, dear God, I've got a lot to look forward to. How exciting it is. Some here do not have anything to look forward to because they're unsaved. I pray this morning that they'd come to know thee today. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. You're in this service this morning. It'd be good to just come to this altar and praise God and thank God and just love him a little while. You're here and you're unsaved. Come down the aisle, trust Christ. You don't have a church home, come. I open the doors of the church right now. We will receive you any way the Bible bears out while we sing. Thank you for viewing our program. We invite you to personally attend our church during one of our Sunday services. 9 a.m., early worship service. 10 a.m., graded Sunday school hour. 10.50 a.m., our regular Sunday morning worship service. 6 p.m., Sunday evening service. And then we invite you to attend our midweek service at 7.30 p.m. on Wednesday evening. Another ministry of the Jupiter Road Baptist Church is the Dallas Life Foundation, a ministry to the less fortunate of our society, the street people. You may see this program each Friday at 6.30 p.m. or Monday at 7 p.m. on the same channel. For additional information about the Jupiter Road Baptist Church or any of our ministries, write to us today. The address is the Jupiter Road Baptist Church, 2422 North Jupiter Road, Garland, Texas, zip code 75042. Tune in next week at this same time for another Sunday service of the Jupiter Road Baptist Church, Dr. James A. Starks, pastor.